Okay, so now we're going to talk about inverse functions. All right, well, only one-to-one -one functions have an inverse function. So if you haven't seen that video on one-to-one -one functions, then you need to see that one first just so you know what we're talking about. So only one-to-one -one functions have an inverse function. All right, you can kind of think of functions that are inverses of each other as they kind of undo one another, so to speak. Um, for example, say we've got f being 3x plus 2. Uh, we could figure out what f of 1 is f of 1 goes to 5. Everybody agree with that? Now if we take this 5 and plug it in over here into this g function, so you find g of 5, okay, you're going to get 5 minus 2 divided by 3, which goes to 3 over 3, which brings you back down to 1. Okay, you get the 1 that we started with over here in f. If that happens every time, say like f of 0, f of 0 gives you 2, and you take that y value, g of 2, and you're going to get 2 minus 2, which is 0 over 3, which is 0. You get the x value back. If that happens every single time between the two functions, then the two functions are what are called inverses of each other. Now there's a formal way to think about that. Let's let f be a one-to-one -one function. Then g is the inverse function of f if f composed with g of x is equal to just x, the identity function, and g composed with f of x is equal to x, the identity function. Both compositions have to happen, right? And if both compositions happen and get you down to the identity function, then f and g are inverses of each other. So let's go back to our two functions that we had. Okay, so if we do this composition, f composed with g of x, then we're going to have f of g of x which is f of x minus 2 divided by 3. All right, and that's going to be, what, 3 times x minus 2 over 3 plus 2. And that's going to go to x minus 2 plus 2, which just goes to x. Now also, g composed with f of x has to go down to x. So we look like this. So g of 3x plus 2. So then take 3x plus 2, plug it in for x. You get 3x plus 2 minus 2 all over 3, which goes to 3x over 3, which just goes to x. All right? So because both compositions take you down to the identity function x, f and g are inverses of each other. That's the, that's the formal definition. All right. So now let's go on to our notation. All right, so here's the notation. f with this little negative 1 up here of x. And you read that as f inverse of x. That's what it means, f inverse of x, or the inverse function of f. All right, it is not an exponent, negative 1. This does not mean 1 over f of x is not equal to 1 over f of x. That's the most common mistake. So just put 1 over f of x, and that's, that's because this, this negative 1 up here does not represent an exponent. This is all function notation, right? So uh, let's talk about what's going on here. So to find the inverse of a one-to-one -one function, we exchange the components of the ordered pairs, right? So here's your function. Let f of x be x minus 1, and here just, I just randomly took three points three ordered pairs that lie on this function. Now its inverse would contain what ordered pairs? Okay, well we just exchange the components of the ordered pairs. So if one zero is on f, then zero one would be on its inverse, as well as one two would be on its inverse, and negative two negative one would be on the inverse. I mean, you, and obviously you would do that for every single ordered pair here for f, and I'm just randomly taking three just to get a point across. So if that was the case, and these are the, th say, three ordered pairs that lie on the inverse, what would the inverse function be? f inverse of x would be, anybody got a guess? That's right, x plus 1. Right, and we use this notation f inverse of x here to say, hey, this function down here is the inverse of this function up here. Right? They have a relationship together. They're inverses of each other. They quote unquote undo one another. Okay? So now let's talk about how to find the inverse of a one to one function. So you start by going back and replacing the function notation with just your y. 
And the reason why is because of step two right here. The whole idea between a function and its inverse is the x and y values interchange. That's it. It's the whole idea. Okay. So they switch spots. So when we have our function, we're just going to interchange x and y. Then we're going to take this new equation that we have and solve for y. We're going to try to get y in terms of x. If y cannot be written as a function of x, then f does not have an inverse function. Okay, so not every function has an inverse function, right? Because only one-to-one -one functions have an inverse function associated with them. So once we've isolated y, then we just replace y back with our function notation and say, hey, this is the inverse function of what we started with. Okay, so here's an example. All right, so find the inverse of f of x equals 5x plus 7. All right, so the first step would be, let's go, all right, y equals 5x plus 7. Step two, this is where x and y switch places. So literally, just the variable switch, that would be an x, 5y, plus 7. All the numbers stay where they are, but the x and the y's interchange. Step three is to isolate y. And so you would have 5y equals x minus 7, so y equals x minus 7 divided by 5. And notice we've written y as a function of x. If you put one number in for x, then you get one number back for y. Okay? And so that is the inverse of f. Right? We just switch back to, in to um, inverse function notation to say, hey, this is the inverse function of what we started with up here. Right? That's it. Now, this step three here, where we isolate i, suppose f was equal to x squared. Right? And so you go, all right, y equals x squared, that's step one. And then step two, we'd say x equals y squared. Then step three, our goal is to isolate y here, right? Well, y is not a function of x. If you put one number in for x, then you get two numbers back for y. That's not a function. Therefore, this function, f of x equals x squared, does not have an inverse function associated with it. Okay, that's algebraically what would happen. Graphically, we know that wouldn't happen because, don't forget, this is a parabola, and it does not pass the horizontal line test, so it can't have an inverse associated with it. I just wanted to point out what can happen uh, when you try to isolate y, and you cannot write y as a function of x, and therefore say, all right, our original function just does not have an inverse function associated with it. All right, so real quick, let's look and see what happens graphically. All right, so graph f of x, so f of x would be the black one here, 5x plus 7. Okay, if you sketch that out, g of x equals x minus 7 by 5, that'd be the red one down here. If you were also graph y equals x, the identity function, right? Remember the identity function, it would look like such. So that's the line y equals x. And the graph of f and the graph of its inverse, g down here, are symmetrical with respect to the line y equals x. In other words, if you fold along this blue line here, the, the identity function, the graph of f would fall on top of the graph of g. That happens every single time uh, when you graph a function and its inverse. Right? They'll always be symmetrical to line y equals x. And that is because on the line y equals x, the x values and the y values are the same number, y equals x. And a function and its inverse function, what happens? Well, the x and y values switch places. Okay? And so just graphically, this is what's going to happen every time. All right, that's it. Study well. Please let me know if you have any questions.